Roseto, Pennsylvania might seem like any other small town in America. Tidy streets lined with modest brick and clapboard homes, a municipal ball field in town square, a handful of restaurants and shops holding out against the encroachment of chain store America. And if you stroll around town, you'll notice that many of the streets and businesses have Italian names. There's Garibaldi Street. Over here is Ruggiero's Market and Colazzo's Heating and Air Conditioning. And of course, Al Giovannini the Barber. That's because at the turn of the last century, a handful of Italians settled here after emigrating from the town of Rosetto in Italy. In fact, if you took a tour of Rosetto in 1900, you probably wouldn't have understood what anyone was saying because everyone still spoke Italian. They really had taken their, their little village of Rosetta Valtore and transferred it to the United States. That's Joseph Stampone, a descendant of one of the founders of the town. They continued to speak Italian, and, and not just Italian, they spoke their Fojian dialect. They spoke their Fojian dialect. They ate as if they were in the old country. They planted gardens together, grew up together, and held on to tight family bonds. Here's Joseph Angelini, a former mayor of Rosetto. It was uh, what they say, alla familia, the family. Uh, Rosetto was one big happy community. We were all, almost everybody was related to each other. And um, there, there, you wouldn't hesitate to help anybody. Uh, like they said, you knew your neighbors, both behind you, in front of you, across the street, wherever. And all they had to do was say, hey, I need help. And there was, the whole neighborhood was there to help. In 1960, a physician named Stuart Wolf was doing a talk at a medical society not too far from Rosetto. He knew Rosetto well because he spent his summers at a farm in a town close by. And when the talk was over, one of the local doctors invited him out for a beer. According to Wolf, the man told him, I've been practicing for 17 years. I get patients from all over, and I rarely find anyone from Rosetto under the age of 65 with heart disease. It was a particularly surprising claim because in the 1950s and 1960s, heart attacks were the leading cause of death in men under the age of 65. But not in Rosetto. There was virtually no heart disease in Rosetto. Wolf was intrigued, so he started a study. The Rosetta study was to try to understand why is it that this town is unique? Is it something in the water? Is it something in the environment and culture? Is it something with the diet? They had no idea what caused this longevity. They invited the entire town to participate uh, in a medical study. And they took blood, they did EKGs, they took uh, a history of these people to try to explain how it could be that they had no heart disease. Wolf recruited a team of grad students and sociologists, and they went to every house in town to talk to anyone 21 years and older. So they conducted all these tests uh, to try to explain away this lack of heart disease. Um, the interesting thing was they first thought it had to be related to their diet because they were you know, from a Mediterranean region and they figured, well, they must have a nice, healthy diet. But it was quite the contrary. Um, when these Rosatons came from Italy to America, uh, they weren't cooking with, with olive oil, they were cooking with lard. Uh, they were very heavy smokers. Uh, many of them were obese. So it was really inexplicable to try to figure out how this lack of heart disease existed with people who were basically doing everything wrong. So after, you know, not being able to explain it by diet, uh, they thought, well, it's got to be genetics. It's got to be they're just from very hardy stock in Europe. So then they decided, well, you know what, let's test some uh, Rosatons uh, from outside of the city of Rosetta, the borough of Rosetta, uh, because others had moved to Easton and other parts of Pennsylvania. They did the same thing, conducted these studies, and lo and behold, these others from Rosetta who were not actually living in the borough, their heart attack rates and their incidence of heart disease was triple that of the Rosatons. So now they're really baffled, you know, what, what explains this? Maybe it's related to the community of Rosetta itself. I mean, these people literally were only dying of old age. And it wasn't just heart disease. Um, their 
incidence of death uh, for all other uh, causes of death was also about three times lower than it was generally in the United States. These Rosatons broke some unwritten rules. They were healthy in spite of themselves. Heart disease was half of what it was in surrounding communities. And to top it off, there was no suicide in the town, no alcoholism, no drug addiction, and very little crime. And after Stuart Wolf had eliminated every possible reason why Rosettans were so much healthier, he and his group of researchers realized they had stumbled upon the answer in the very homes they were visiting. The community, Wolf said, was very cohesive. There was no keeping up with the Joneses. Houses were very close together and everyone lived more or less alike. Elders were revered and incorporated into community life. The Rosatons created a powerful sense of place, a tight-knit community. In short, they were nourished by each other. Wolf's co-worker, the sociologist John Brew, described it this way. I remember going to Rosetta for the first time and you'd see three generational family meals. People walking up and down the street, people sitting on their porches talking to each other. It was magical. Two native Rosettans remember this time very well. Nobody was stressed out when I was growing up. My parents were never stressed. See, we were happy. And I think that's the main thing. To modern ears, Rosetto sounds like a fable, a place of calm, a place of fellowship and harmony, somewhere that might have dropped out of a Norman Rockwell painting or a Garrison Keillor tale. But Rosetto was no fable. It was not a perfect place, of course. People clashed, jobs were lost, families squabbled. But the place, the community, the way they live buffered them from the stresses of the day. Rosetto is a tale about pulling together rather than the modern American story of coming apart. And that, in many ways, is the theme for this season. And what good things shake out when communities come together. From the Stanford Center on Longevity, this is Century Lives Place Matters. I'm your host, Ken Stern. And I'm producer Carrie Thompson. In this series, we'll visit some remarkable places. Like Birmingham, Alabama. Presidio, Texas. Co-op City in the Bronx. Wayne County, Kentucky. We go to these places because like Rosetto, they defy the odds. They're outliers. But first, to understand why place matters within the U.S., we need to zoom way out and take a look at how America is doing in terms of life expectancy. Because compared to its peer nations, the U.S. is also an outlier, but not in a good way. When Stuart Wolf happened upon Rosetto 60 years ago, the story of life expectancy in the United States was actually pretty good. As you might expect in a big, sprawling, complicated society like the US, there were both bright spots and societal embarrassments. But on average, life expectancy was on par with the leading nations of Western Europe and increasing at a steady rate. Wouldn't you say this reflects our mid-century vision of ourselves? healthy, vigorous, pushing the world forward. That's right. But then in the 70s and 80s, something strange and troubling started to happen. The body of evidence that we've looked at, whether you're talking about life expectancy or mortality rates or a variety of other health metrics, indicates that the U.S. was doing relatively well until the 70s and 80s. And then something happened. Um, and health in the U.S. began to uh, advance more slowly than in other countries, um, and death rates began to increase from a, a variety of different causes. That's a different Dr. Wolf. This one is Steve Wolf of Virginia Commonwealth University. He's describing an incredible and wholly unwanted transition that began to occur around 1980. From the U.S. as a world leader in healthy longevity to something much less appealing. Today, we're roughly 40th in global life expectancy, a little below Lebanon, a little above Albania. We're closer to Belarus than we are to Japan. It's a deficit, as Steve Wolf explains, shared, if somewhat unequally, by all of us. Well, we have very serious racial and ethnic disparities in our country and, and uh, people of color, as well as low income folks uh, have higher death rates and lower life expectancy. So that, that gap relative to peer countries was even larger for those 
disadvantaged populations, but it's a mistake to think that uh, the more privileged populations in our society are doing fine. Uh, in our analyses, we found that uh, white Americans are more likely to die than white people in other countries. Rich Americans are more likely to die than rich people in other countries. So there's a systemic problem affecting all social classes in the United States. That's interesting, but how much do life expectancy trends really matter? Some would say they matter a lot. Just ask Lottie Aaron of the Urban Institute, who's been thinking about these issues for decades. Life expectancy isn't really a prediction for a single individual. It's more like a check engine light, an indicator of the health of society as a whole. And that indicator light in the U.S. is practically lighting up the sky. So Ken, what happened in the 70s and 80s that changed the trajectory of life expectancy in this country? To answer that question, let's go back to Rosetto. Because what happened there is a parable for the entire country. You remember the researcher Stuart Wolf who did the original study? Yep. Well, he decided to check back in with Rosetto 20 years later. He called his study the Rosetto Effect, a 50-year comparison of mortality rates. And as it turns out, things had changed. Here's what he wrote. Rosetto was shifting from its initially highly homogeneous social order, made up of three-generation households, to a less cohesive, materialistic, more Americanized community in which three-generation households were uncommon and inter-ethnic marriages became the norm. In plainer words, I think what happened to Rosetta was that we became Americanized. Former Rosetto mayor Joseph Angelini. Most of the parents worked hard to make sure their kids got a good education. As a result of that education, we had no place to work around here. So they had to go move out of town. Their parents were passing away. The homes were going up for sale. The Americanization, again, brought other people into the borough. Now you didn't know your neighbor. Hey, I need help. So hopefully there was a family member in town that could come and help you because you couldn't count on the neighbors anymore. Uh, that family effect was gone. And uh, that's what's happening today. And from the 70s onward, Rosetto became integrated into American society and reverted to the mean, a place of civic disengagement, heart disease, unmanaged stress, and declining life expectancy. So we know what happened to Rosetto, but what happened to America more generally? I mean, the country didn't get more American, did it? That is a question that is worth thousands or even millions of American lives, right? That's Michael Stepner, a professor at the University of Toronto. America had longevity to match its peer countries. Many more Americans would be living into older age. So I can tell you there are a number of areas that are well documented where America is just not, is clearly diverging from its peer countries. Okay, so what are the factors that are affecting life expectancy in this country? Well, let's ask Steve Wolf. The one we typically think of first in the United States is our healthcare system. So healthcare is important to our health, but research shows that it only accounts for about 10 to 20 percent of health outcomes. And? Our behaviors matter. Uh, classically, we think about things like smoking or exercise or how much we eat. Um, more relevant right now include choices of uh, our behaviors around the use of drugs. Uh, and specifically with COVID-19, our behaviors in terms of uh, controlling exposure to the virus or getting vaccinated. That environment influences our exposure to risks and whether we have amenities in our neighborhoods that are important for health. The fourth category is social and economic factors. And by this, I'm referring to things like education, income, wealth, uh, income inequality, and so forth. And finally, public policies. And that, in our country, includes uh, federal policies as well as state and local policies. All these factors do impact life expectancy but they don't really explain why the U.S. diverged from its peer countries around 1980. Problems, for example, with racial disparities and environmental degradation happened well before then, and some things like smoking rates and child poverty have improved, sometimes dramatically, over the last 40 years. What about homicide rates? Are they at work here? No, actually, Gary, uh, homicide rates in the U.S. actually peaked around 1980 and have fallen since then overall. This is one of the things that researchers grapple with. There are lots of different factors affecting life expectancy, 
and they don't often match up neatly. But there's one big thing that actually does match up quite well with the time frame we're working with. And like Rosetto, it's a story about the decline in social capital. So you know how researchers described how the sense of community in Rosetto started to fray. People moved away, sold the family home. That tight-knit community dissipated. So the loss of social capital. Right. Well, as it turns out, this has been happening across the U.S. on a much larger scale. Back in the 90s, a Harvard political scientist named Robert Putnam noticed that Americans were participating less in community affairs. And when you hear how he figured this out, it might surprise you a bit. One of the owners of one of the largest bowling lane chains in America heard I was working on this topic and came to me and said, look, you don't know, but you've stumbled onto one of our biggest economic problems. We don't know why it is, but people are, although they're coming into bowl, they're bowling alone and they're not uh, bowling in leagues. And that matters to us because they don't drink as much beer and eat as many pretzels if they bowl alone. Bowling lane owners are concerned about the decline in league bowling because of the bottom line. I'm concerned about it because it's just another example of a missing occasion on which people no longer get together and can sit around and talk about uh, community affairs. In 2000, Putnam wrote about this phenomena in his book, Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. In it, he talks about the decline in the types of organizations that bring communities together. Religious organizations, unions, sewing circles, the Elks and Kiwanis. These declines started in the 1970s, just before life expectancy growth began to slow. And Putnam chronicled that it was happening all across society. The mystery of trying to figure out why it's happening is increased by the fact that the same trend applies to all sorts of different groups in American society. It's, it, there's a trend downwards in civic engagement among women and among men, among blacks and among whites, among well-educated people and among less well-educated people. Putnam did have a culprit for this mystery. He pointed the finger at technology as a principal offender. Technological change is privatizing our leisure time. For example, the average American uh, every year spends more hours listening to music per week, but less hours listening to music in the company of another person. So attendance at concert halls uh, is down, or, or jazz clubs is down, and sales of CDs is, is up. This general tendency is, of course, embodied most especially in, in uh, TV, in the role of TV in our lives. But as you move over the course of this century from vaudeville to movies to TV to VCRs to uh, virtual reality machines, we are spending more and more of our leisure time in, a more, in more and more isolated contexts. So Ken, how did the decline in community in the 70s start to have a negative effect on health and longevity in the U.S.? That's an important question, and one that researchers are reluctant to give a definitive answer on. Here's Michael Stepner again. One of the things that is interesting that you're highlighting is that that je ne sais quoi, that thing that causes these certain places to really be a tremendous place to live in terms of people's quality of life, and also be a tremendous place to live in terms of people's length of life is, in this case, something that's hard to measure, right? How can we measure social ties? It's something that uh, some researchers work on, but inevitably, the quality of those social ties, the depth of those social ties, it's tremendously challenging to gather that data. But that doesn't stop Stepner from giving his sense of the matter. Social capital, loneliness in particular, is a terrible disease. And so a weakening of social ties, I, I would certainly believe that that would have a causal effect on people's mortality. It would be connected to people's deaths of despair. And so humans are tremendously social creatures. We talked about how destructive loneliness can be and how much we depend on a safety net, because not every year is a good year in anyone's life. We all have bad years, whether it's income-wise or health-wise, how we rely on other people in those years. And the decline in social capital and support systems don't operate in isolation. It's accentuated, as Stepner tells us, by a parallel decline in government support for struggling individuals and families that also started in the 1980s. Families have gotten smaller, communities have gotten smaller, people are more isolated from 
their neighbors, their peers. The idea that that informal safety net has weakened in parallel with the formal safety net is very plausible to me. And the story there really makes a lot of sense. The loss of social support means that we all have fewer tools to help us manage the inevitable stresses of modern life. And that's a serious health issue on a larger scale. Just ask Dr. Mark Garevich, a professor in population health at the NYU School of Medicine. You get chronic stress. Stress is a fundamental driver of poor health. It inflames the heart vessels. Uh, it causes, uh, 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 it's, it's associated with the development of cancer uh, and the uh, development of cardiovascular disease over years. Um, and so conditions that are uh, where in which life is more strenuous and uh, under-supported uh, create poor health in the long term. I asked Steve Wolf for his take. How it all connects? I think part of what's happened is the social contract that used to exist in the United States has been pulled out from under us. Um, so it used to be that you you had some hope of social mobility. You 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 had a factory job, and if if you worked uh, your life in that factory job and were loyal to your employer, uh, the company was going to look after you. Um, and you're going to earn enough money to be able to buy a house and put your kids through school and, and maybe have retirement, uh, you know, a pension and, and a stable retirement. And that, that's the way things worked for your, your dad, and it, and it was the way it worked for his dad. But all of that social fabric has been overturned where we, we find that uh, people are being laid off, the companies are not looking after them, they don't have that confidence that their kids are gonna do better than they are. And I think that has e eroded health. But also, it introduces a set of stresses. And so we've seen in our analysis of rising death rates in the working age population, uh, an interesting regional pattern in which the largest increases in death rates in that age group have been occurring in places like the industrial Midwest, the Rust Belt. It, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that this is the part of the country that was hit the hardest by some of these economic changes. It's also the area of the country that's experienced some of the greatest ravages of the op opioid epidemic. People that were more vulnerable to drug addiction in terms of uh, coping with their stresses. But then why have the wealthy in the U.S.? who've done so well for themselves financially over the past few decades, also done poorly compared to other countries when it comes to life expectancy. Surely financial freedom would cushion the stress and loneliness of our era. I asked Wolf why the wealthy have also done poorly, and it's an issue we should all be concerned with. There are forms of social isolation that are affecting uh, uh, people in all social classes, and if you're in a gated community or um, out in a, in a rural area and don't have the kinds of social networks that people in prior generations enjoyed, uh, that probably does adversely affect health. Lottie Aaron thinks we should be paying much closer attention to what we might learn from all those countries that have done better than us over the last 40 years. I really don't know if it's down to the American psychology as much as it is to kind of the prevailing narrative about America and what makes us um, such a unique nation and our kind of fierce protection of what we call freedom <laughs> and also our size and complexity and diversity. I'm sure that plays um, a part of it too. But, you know, honestly, that's why I'm so intrigued by the international comparisons because even though I know Many Americans don't particularly care about how other countries organize their societies and um, what's happening uh, in other countries. I do think that these cross-national comparisons really throw into relief a very different set of issues as to what might be driving outcomes in the United States. And so the fact that almost every other advanced democracy is beating us on every measure of morbidity and mortality at almost half the uh, cost in, on the healthcare side, I think is a profound observation 
that I don't think many Americans fully understand or appreciate, and that might cause them to ask some different questions about what's going on here and, you know, what decisions are being made by our leaders, um, policymakers, the business community, and others that are leading to these outcomes. It's hard to argue with her, given the numbers. But it may not be necessary to look only to other countries. There are places right here in the U.S. that buck our national trend. Communities with mechanisms that bring people together. Places where the social fabric creates far more than a safety net. And it turns out, especially for poor communities, that there are other Rosettos out there. Not as many as we might hope, but enough to convince researchers that place does matter. Here's Michael Stepner again, talking about his 2016 study of county-level life expectancy in the U.S. I think the very first thing that popped out at us as interesting was how much more variation there was for low-income people than high-income people. The, the, yeah, sort of the first finding that really stuck in our minds was it seems like if you are, don't have a lot of money in the United States, your life expectancy varies tremendously depending on where you live. And Stepner has an idea about how to lessen that gap. We should really learn from the places with high life expectancy, with long lives and growing lives, to learn what are the elements of that place. What is it about that place that is good for people's uh, longevity? So that's our mission for the season, to travel the country, identify the bright spots, and see if they can be replicated elsewhere. We've already been to Presidio, Texas in the first episode of the season, but we have many more stops to come. Like Wayne County, Kentucky, which has shown resilience amidst the opioid epidemic. And Birmingham, Alabama, which has had one of the highest life expectancy increases this century. And Co-op City in the Bronx, the largest naturally occurring retirement community in North America. We hope that you'll join us on our travels. And if you do, you won't think about healthy longevity in the same way ever again. The producers of Century Lives are Carrie Thompson and Aaron Bump. Music for this episode was provided by Audio Network. Special thanks to Gabriella Flamini for access to her documentary, The Rose Garden, History of the Rosetto Effect. Century Lives is a production of the Stanford Center on Longevity, where our mission is to support ideas and research so that century-long lives are healthy and rewarding ones. You can find out more about us at longevity.stanford.edu. I'm Ken Stern. Thanks for listening.